Thank you for checking out this video. So I've seen a bunch of people doing these uh, lists. I, I haven't seen a video yet, but people doing these lists of the best horror movies of the 2010s because obviously the 2010s are over. We have a completed a decade. So I saw these lists and I was just like, oh, you know, that looks like a little bit of fun. So I want to do this video, put it out there for everyone to watch. And uh, you can contribute as well. Put your comments down here. I'd love to hear people's top 20, top 10, top 15, whatever you feel like. Hey, hey even if you want to do like a top three, don't care. But put them down there. I really want to hear it. So uh, and then you can say whatever you want about mine. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Good picks, bad picks, whatever. So. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about each one. I, I have 20 and I'm going to give you like a few sentences about them because if there's something on the list that you haven't seen yet, I don't want to spoil anything about it. So this is no spoilers, but I'll just be giving that information. Um, the other thing is disclaimer on this. I have not seen every single horror film that came out in the 2010s. I have not even seen every single one that people talked very highly about. So... You know, they might not be on there just because I haven't seen them. Like, uh, prime example, I have not yet seen Dr. Sleep. I've heard really good things about Dr. Sleep, and I assume I'm probably going to like it because I really like Mike Flanagan, so maybe that would have been on this list had I already seen it, but it came out too late in 2019. Uh, there are some other movies along the way that I just haven't gotten to yet, so, you know. But anyway, let's get into it. My number 20 of the 2010s is Krampus by Michael Dougherty. Now... Part of this might be because I'm a big Michael Dougherty fan, but I, uh, I really think that this is a really nice mashup of a little bit of comedy and some good scares and really good practical effects set during Christmas, which we don't get a ton of Christmas horror films. I just feel like this one has a really nice mixture of comedy and, and scares and practical effects. So, recommend that at number 20. My number 19 is... One of my favorite horror comedies, which is Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, and this is by Eli Craig. Now, this one is very funny, uh, and it's very, very hard to get a good mixture of funny and actual horror. Uh, this is more on the funny side heavy, but the story still really works, and it doesn't take too much away. And Tyler Levine is really funny, Alan Tudyk is really funny, and it's awesome. It's, it's expertly done, very funny, love it. Number 18 for me is Summer of 84. Now, this is one that's, I believe, an exclusive, either an exclusive to Shudder or an original for Shudder. This one's by Francois Samard, Anouk Wassel, and Yohan Carl Wassel. So three people directed it. Um, this one reminded me a lot of a little It, a lot of The Goonies. It's got this that kind of feel. It was a very interesting story about young kids in a neighborhood and they believe that one of their neighbors is a serial killer. And just kind of all the misadventures that these kids get into. Uh, I think it was very well written, very well acted, and very well shot. Uh, and once again, there's some good comedy in it. So I would highly recommend that one. And I believe it's, yeah, it's on Shudder if you have Shudder. Uh, my number 17 is The Loved Ones by Sean Byrne. Now this is an Australian film. Uh, it's very hard to watch for people who don't like the torture porn version of horror films so or subgenre I should say of horror films so um yeah it's very brutal at times but it is very well written there's there it's in a weird way there's kind of some um some very emotional times when it's not even like not something that seems like it would normally be emotional the act uh the acting in this is very very excellent the musical choices are very excellent uh, it's a compelling story, and it's very interesting, and it looks great. So that's my number 17. My number 16 is Antiviral by Brandon Cronenberg. Yes, the son of David Cronenberg. Now, this one had Ma Malcolm McDowell in it, and um, one of my favorite actors, Caleb Landry Jones. Very underrated, awesome actor. He was also in uh, Get Out as the brother with the, he used the um, lacrosse stick at one point. So he... Uh, he plays uh, a person who's involved in this kind of crazy futuristic thing where they're kind of growing celebrity cells as like meat in a way. It's it's very weird, but trust me, it, it sings of normal David Cronenberg. It looks amazing. It's kind of gross at times. The acting is outstanding because Caleb Brandry Jones does an outstanding job, plus Malcolm McDowell always does a good job. So that's my number 16. Number 15, The Witch by Robert Eggers. 
Now, I know people were very divided on this film. I think, it, first of all, you have to admit, it looks amazing. And I like how they leached a lot of color out of the film and made it look very drab, which was appropriate for the time period they're going for with this. Now, for me, it plays very well as a kind of fairy tale of the whole time you go through it, you're like, is this a fairy tale? Is this real life for what I'm seeing in the film? And it kind of brings up uh, an idea of living in this time and hearing things about, you know, dark forces. You know, do you view it as a, would you have viewed it as a fairy tale or would you have thought it's actually real? And how does that play with your mind and what is really going on in this? And it has, a, it has an interesting ending. I've heard people say they wish it ended differently, but I was okay with the ending. I guess maybe I would have liked if it ended differently. But uh, it doesn't take too much away. It's, it's a very good film. And that's why it's my number 15. Number 14, The Perfect Host by Nick Tomney. Now, this one came out closer to the beginning of the 2010s. And it um, has a... Oh, I forget what his name is. He was the brother in... Um, oh, I'm so blanking on it. Frasier. He was the brother in the show Frasier. Um, Pierce. Nigel Pierce. I believe is his name. Yes, he did a really good job. Uh, it's about him having a dinner party, but something is off. And I don't want to say anything past that. The acting is phenomenal. Nigel Pierce did a wonderful job. Uh, it looks really good. It's very well directed, very well set up. A very interesting story, and I highly recommend that one. That's why it's my number 14. My number 13 is Gerald's Game by Mike Flanagan. Now, this is based off a uh, Stephen King book. And it was on, this is a Netflix original, I believe. And so you can find it there if you have Netflix. Uh, you have to give it time. I know a lot of people who watch this film, they were like, I gave it 20 minutes and then I quit. You have to go all the way to the end. And I remember when I was sitting through it, getting pretty far into it and being like, are we going to do something really? But trust me, there's a payoff. It, it's not very expected, but it's sweet it's impactful, it's horrific, it's all sorts of things in the very end, and it's not what you would expect, but stick with it. It's very, very good, and that was the film that I saw that really piqued my interest in Mike Flanagan. That was before The Haunting of Hill House, which he did and was excellent on Netflix. So that's why that is my number 13. Number 12, Crimson Peak by Guillermo del Toro. Beautiful film, unbelievably gorgeous as a film. Uh, it had the proper amount of horror elements. It's very Guillermo del Toro in his costuming, in his effects, in the design of the things in it. Uh, and it had an interesting enough story. It wasn't the best story, but one of the big things for me is it's a gorgeous film. It looks so good, and the atmosphere is everything in it. It's wonderful, so check that one out. Number 11. Now, this is this is a weird one, and some people may question whether this is actually horror or not. It's very fringe to me, uh, but I put it on here. It's My number 11 is Rubber by Quentin Dupieux. Uh, now, this one is very odd. It's about a tire that can do things with its mind. That's basically telekinesis. A tire with telekinesis. Sounds ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And I went into it expecting for it to be a so just awful movie that I could just laugh at. I watched it with a buddy, and by the end, we turned to each other in silence and then eventually said, I kind of loved that movie. <laughs> it is very interesting. If you get the underlying theme to it, it's very, very interesting. It has a lot to say, and if you know what it's trying to say, it's pretty genius. I highly recommend it. Plus, it's just entertaining. It's very, very entertaining. So that's why Rubber is my number 11. Number 10, The Autopsy of Jane Doe by Andre Overdahl. I have an uh, in-depth review of this film on my channel. I really, really enjoy that film. Uh, I think it's a very interesting new concept about a autopsy, as you can probably tell, a father and son doing an autopsy, and things start to happen while they're doing the autopsy. So it's very cool because things are very slowly revealed throughout it. It keeps you very interested and engaged, and it keeps the tension up. Very well acted, too. I highly recommend this one. Very original. Love it. Number nine, I know a lot of people have put this on their list, The Babadook by Jennifer Kent. This one, another one that's severely impactful. It speaks to a much deeper level, emotional level, 
and this is another one when you're going through it where it's hard to tell, well, is it this going on or is it this going on? And I love films like that that kind of keep you guessing till the end. And for some people, they may say, even in the end, it was still very ambiguous, but I'm okay with that. And I have my feeling on which way I think it actually goes in the end, but there are many interpretations of it, and that's cool. It looks so good. This is kind of like a less is more type film where the main thing that they show in it in bits and pieces, they're very smart in just doing it in bits and pieces and how they do it. Uh, it's pretty simplistic, but it's extremely, extremely effective. Uh, another one that's a very interesting, pretty original story idea. So that's why The Babadook is my number nine. Number eight, this is another one I actually have a review for on my channel, Annihilation by Alex Garland. Uh, another one that's beautiful. It looks amazing. This was a high-budget one. It had Natalie Portman in it, and this is another one that I love the underlying themes on it, what it's really speaking to. Uh, you really, really have to pay attention to it, and there's some really horrific and gross and disturbing stuff in it, but at the same time, it's also beautiful, so it's this really cool kind of scale balancing between those two things. And obviously the performance is really, performances are really good because it's so high budget and the lead is Natalie Portman. Really great film. Love what it has to say. So that's why that's my number eight. Number seven, what we do in the shadows by Jermaine Clement and Taika Waititi. So, um, I know a lot of people think it's kind of weird when a, when a horror comedy makes it up that high, but this one is excellently crafted. There's, just like Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, there's a really nice amount of comedy to it that doesn't take away from the story. It blends very well with it. Very good jokes, very funny, uh, very engaging. It's got a very fun and funny story and just a cool story at the same time that could work on a purely horror level if they took the comedy out of it. So it's it's one of those that is severely inventive, and the acting is very good, and they land the lines just the right way they need to. So that's why what we do in the shadows is my number seven. Number six, this is one I haven't really seen people talk about, Attack the Block by Joe Cornish. Now this is more of like a mix of like horror sci-fi, but hey, that still falls into horror. Love the design of the creatures in this one. Unbelievable. This was a start for John Boyega, who people know have gone on, has gone on to be Finn in the newer Star Wars films, and he is an excellent actor. He was an excellent actor in Attack the Block, and it is a fun film. It is uh, action-packed. The acting is really good. It looks phenomenal. Like I said, the creature design is really nice, and it's just a really, really, really good time. I highly recommend Attack the Block. That's why it's my number six. Now, number five. I also did a review for this one on my channel, but it was right after I saw it in the theater, so it's not a spoiler review. It's on no spoilers, only just talking about themes, and that is Ari Aster's Midsummer, which came out this year. Um, uh, this is another one. I love all the underlying themes of it. This film also looks amazing. Aster is an unbelievable director, uh, cinematography is ridiculous. He did some very bold things with this because it's not your typical horror film. He took a lot of chances. I felt like it paid off. One of the big things is all the horrific things happen in broad daylight. That's not really a spoiler. It's just, you know, you can tell that from the, uh, from the trailer. But there's some really horrific things in this. But there's some things that just make you scratch your head and you're like, what is going on? Things really ratchet up. And if you can see what the underlying themes are with it, it really ties in and it gets you thinking and it sticks with you after the fact. And it's, it's a good one. So that's my number five. My number four, Assassination Nation by Sam Levinson. Also did a review for this one. Uh, I think that was also a no, no spoilers one since it's in a newer film. This one had a lot, a lot, a lot to say. I think it looked, once again, looked unbelievable. It was gorgeous. Cinematography was ridiculous. Directing was unbelievable. The acting was really good for the most part. Musical choices were so good in this one. Except for me, like, one, one part. I think the musical choice was a little weird. But for the most part, music was used to great effect in this. Uh, pretty... I mean, it, it is and is not a super unique idea. It's kind of taking an idea that's already been done and kind of putting a more interesting spin on it. Uh, but it, it's a 
at its face value, it's a ridiculous concept, but through the filmmaking, they actually make it feel realistic, like it could happen that way. So that's a big triumph in itself. Um, really compelling, really interesting, looks amazing. Cool underlying themes. Really, really like that film. That's my number four. Number three, It Chapter One. I've not seen It Chapter Two yet. I've heard mixed things on that one, but everyone loved It Chapter One for the most part. Once again, looked unbelievable. Bill Skarsgård's Pennywise, I thought, was very inspired and very interesting. He made it his own. I wouldn't say that his Pennywise is better than Tim Curry's. I think they're very different, and they're very great in their own rights. So it was cool that he was able to do his own thing and not feel like he had to be too influenced by Tim Curry, who did an excellent job as well. Now, this one is an old story that everyone knows, but I think they did a really good job to execute it really well. Like I said, makes it look really good. The child actors did an awesome, awesome job on this one. Now, it's a super high-budget film, so you would expect that it, that it would do really well, but there are plenty of times where high-budget films just miss the mark. They're not inspired. They don't pull things off well. This one did an excellent job, so that's why it's my number three. Number two, Hereditary by Ari Aster. Now, that's the second one for Ari Aster. I like how Ari Aster does things, much like what I said about Midsummer Cinematography, outstanding. Directing, outstanding. Uh, the acting, unbelievable in this one. Tony Collette was ridiculous. Everyone really in it was ridiculous with their acting. Uh, horrific, scary, tough to watch at times. I saw it in the theater, and there were a lot of people who you know, audibly gasped at one part during the film, and it was totally out of nowhere. This is one that a lot of people don't like the end. It's very, it's a dividing film that you either love it or you hate it pretty much because there are pieces of the main story littered throughout the film, and it doesn't spoon feed you at the very end. Now, some people really hate that, and I get that. Like, I know people who want to watch horror films and be like, just tell me what's going on, just give me a story in the end and say this is what went on. Like, I get it. Some people don't want to have to really work for that kind of stuff. I really like that stuff. I think it's kind of fun afterwards to just, as it sits with you, think about it and try and put the puzzle pieces together, and this film definitely does that. Uh, but I think also there's just a lot of good straight-up scares and horrific stuff in there for people who aren't necessarily big into the whole, you know, doing the puzzle thing. So, Hereditary, my number two. Now, my number one, I don't know if people see this coming or not, but it's one of my favorite all-time films by Drew Goddard. It is The Cabin in the Woods. Now, the script for this one was written by Joss Whedon and Drew Goddard. I think they only did it in like three days from what I had read. I will be doing a review of this one at some point because I love it so much. Now, this was a really awesome instance of it's, it's totally like this crazy genius thing to me. When I first watched it, I was expecting a straight-up horror film. And I know a lot of people going to the theater felt the same way. They were like, oh, this is going to be a horror film. Uh, it's not straight up. There's some comedy in, uh, injected into it. And there's some weird stuff that goes on. But you get it at the end. There's a point to it. And the big thing is, this isn't really a spoiler, but just know that Joss Whedon and Drew Goddard use the horror film formula to say hey guess what it is stupid that we feel like we have to hold to the horror film formula and the way they do that with using it to make this point is genius 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 and there's good practical effects in it cinematography looks great directing is awesome the acting is very good there's a pre-thor chris hemsworth in it who does a very good job and um yeah, it's a fun film, it's a action-packed film, it is a genius film, and that's why The Cabin in the Woods is my number one film of the 2010s. Hopefully there's at least a few people out there who feel me on some of my picks for this. I'm sure there are people who will, who will be like, of the 20, I think you got like two right. <laughs> Not necessarily placement or anything, because I will tell you, it took me a long time to sit there and actually put them in an order. It, it was... It took me about a day or so to get my full 20 down, and then from there it took me about another day or so to put them in an actual order because it was really hard. And a lot of these are pretty pretty close, and you know, given whatever day it is and what mood I'm in, I would have had you know one ahead of the other one, so it's hard to know. But anyway, 
what are your thoughts? Like I said in the beginning, put your comments down there, your top movies, however many you feel like, 1, 5, 20, 50, I don't care. Put it down in the comments, let me know, we'll talk about it. Uh, and I'm sure there are some ones that people will put down here and I'll be like, oh my gosh, that should have been in my top 20. And I just didn't think about it, but cool. Uh, so thank you for checking this out. Please do me a favor, hit that subscribe if you could. Um, really, really appreciate that. You can do a like, but the subscribe is the big thing. So thanks any, uh, thanks anyway for checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.